water. Without it, nothing lives. It is mysterious, uncontrollable. Water also purifies, cleans, recreates. It brings death and gives life. The people of the city of Kiev, capital of Kiev and Rus, were baptized into the Christian faith in 988 AD. The faith that flowed from that event is part of the Ukrainian heritage and is celebrated by Ukrainian people throughout the world. The early history of the people and nation that came to be known as Kiev and Rus and later as Ukraine is lost in time. Through trade and numerous tribal wars, the development of Ukraine was a mixture of cultural influences and bloodlines. One of the earliest references to the people of Ukraine is found in the Bible. Colossians 3, verse 11 says, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. The Scythians are among the ancient ancestors of the Ukrainian people. It is thought that Andrew, the first called disciple of Christ, visited Ukrainian lands. Many of the stories of St. Andrew's missionary adventures are considered to be legendary. The primary chronicle, the oldest written record of the Eastern Slavs dating from the 11th century, tells that St. Andrew traveled up the Dnipro River. The chronicle writer, Nestor, tells that St. Andrew stopped beneath the hills upon which the city of Kiev presently stands. He is said to have prophesied to his disciples. See ye these hills, so shall the favor of God shine upon them, that on this spot a great city shall arise, and God shall erect many churches therein. St. Andrew is celebrated as the patron of the Kievan church and part of the X-shaped cross on which St. Andrew is thought to have been martyred was later incorporated into the lower bar of the distinctive cross that marks many Ukrainian sanctuaries. Боже, очисти мене грішно, помилуй мене, Боже, очисти мене грішно, помилуй мене, Боже, очисти мене грішно, помилуй мене, звинути нас від проклад закону часної твоєї крові. На спомен Господа Бой спаси нашого Ісуса Христа. На спомен Господа Бой спаси нашого Ісуса Христа. На спомен Господа Бой спаси нашого Ісуса Христа. Що бере гріхи людства за для життя світу на спасіння. Проколи владику. Один із воїнів проколо говорив про зараз свити клакро і видай того, що бачив, і засвідчив січнього праведним. Бо Твоє є царство, і сила, і слава Отця, і Сина, і Святого Духа, нині посяк час, і на віки вічні. Святих славних кроків ми сей ромах, і на сей дві дні, і 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 сей дві дні, Господи, чого так намножилось на пам'яті моїй? Багато їх просто я проти мене, багато їх каже до душі моєї, і немає йому спасіння Бога Його. 
Але ж, Господи, де заступник не єси, і моє славу ти підносиш голову мою. Ага, твій родину і помиря, Господи, в освіти родини і помиря, Господи. Помиря, Господи. Чому ад велика веселя піднімаєшся, чи дуже твій? Туди до мого господарства, Господи. Покрила би все зло, небеса святих, чистих, хвалих, тих, 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 хвалих, it is known that people of the North Black Sea coast had early contact with Christianity. Both Greek and Gothic settlements in Crimea had well-established churches by the 4th and 5th centuries. Tradition holds that Saint Clement, the third bishop of Rome, was banished in 94 AD to Crimea. He is believed to have been martyred for proselytizing among fellow prisoners. According to legend, he was thrown into the Black Sea with an anchor about his neck. There was lively trade between the Crimean colonies and the people of the interior along Ukraine's many rivers. The message of the Gospels was undoubtedly spread through these interactions. As the Apostolic Church expanded, there was a need for structure. Priests and deacons were called from among the people to lead communities of believers in prayer. Later, bishops and archbishops were designated to oversee districts composed of many local churches. In capital cities, metropolitanates were founded to provide spiritual and administrative leadership, eventually providing leadership for entire provinces. The conversion of Emperor Constantine to Christianity in 312 AD had a long-lasting influence on the relationship of church and state. Although he was not baptized until shortly before his death, Constantine felt responsible for the unity of the church. He convened the first ecumenical or universal council at Nicaea in 325 AD. This assembly of church leaders began the process of officially establishing and recognizing a hierarchy in the church. It also produced the first seven articles of the Nicene Creed still used in churches today. When Constantine moved the seat of the empire from Rome to Constantinople in 330, he shifted the focus eastward and contributed to the independence of the Western Church. At the Fourth Ecumenical Council in 451, the five bishops of the cities of Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem were acknowledged as patriarchs. The Patriarchate of Rome was ranked first among equals, but soon its bishops began to see themselves as the rightful leaders of the church. The other four patriarchates did not agree with Rome's view. As the result of political changes, by the year 800, the patriarchates found themselves separated by imperial borders. In spite of many problems experienced by the church, work was being done by dedicated Christians to bring people to the faith. In the ninth century, two brothers, St. Cyril and St. Methodius, dedicated their lives to mission work among the Slavic people. They developed a Slavonic alphabet. They also translated the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom into the Slavonic language in order to celebrate the faith in the language of the people. Oh, 
Najczczujca Słucha Boży Stefan w imię Ojca i Syna i Świętego Ducha. Amen. Kniehenia Olha was the first leader of Kievan Rus to be baptized into the Christian faith. The event most likely took place in Constantinople in 957. By embracing the Christian faith, Olha provided an inspiring example for her people to follow. Patriarch of Constantinople baptized Olha and said, Blessed art thou among the women of Rus, for thou hast loved the light and quit the darkness. The primary chronicle states, Olha was the precursor of the Christian land, even as the day spring precedes the sun and the dawn precedes the day. Saint Olha's son, Kniaz Sviatoslav, did not follow her path into Christianity and devoted his energies into expanding the territory of Rus. Nor at first did her grandson, Kniaz Volodymyr. When Volodymyr came to the throne, he wanted unity and respectability for his state. In the 10th century, that meant adopting a religion. At first, Volodymyr tried to make idol worship a state religion. However, Slavic paganism had no organized structure and varied greatly in belief and practice. Such beliefs were considered backward and inferior by many of the states surrounding Rus. Kniaz Volodymyr's decision to accept Christianity was motivated by practical as well as spiritual concerns. The primary chronicle tells how representatives of Muslim and Jewish faiths as well as Roman and Greek Christianity made presentations to Volodymyr encouraging him to adopt their beliefs. He, in turn, sent emissaries to see how each religion worshipped God. The emissaries reported back. The Greeks led us to the edifices where they worshipped their God and we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth. For on earth there is no such splendor or such beauty, and we are at a loss how to describe it. strictly factual record, but it does give the options that were before him. In choosing a religion, he would be embracing a worldview, a system of moral and ethical beliefs, and also aligning his people culturally, economically, and politically. There is no agreement as to when and where Volodymyr himself was baptized. He agreed to accept Christianity in order to marry Anna, the sister of Byzantine Emperor Basil II, and make firm a political alliance. According to legend, Volodymyr stalled being baptized and was afflicted with an eye disease. He was told by Anna 
he would remain blind until he became a Christian. Volodymyr was baptized and his sight was miraculously restored. Once Volodymyr was baptized, he took his new faith seriously. He had the idols in Kiev destroyed. Volodymyr sent heralds throughout Kiev, demanding all the residents, rich or poor, to gather at the river to be baptized or risk his displeasure. The people came and were baptized, and from the baptism came a vast historic journey of faith. Слуга Божий Брент Стефан у врезу правді в ім'я Отця і Сина і Святого Духа. Амінь. Одіж, подай мені світло, щоб тягнувся світло. Saint Volodymyr enthusiastically embraced his new faith and took up the challenge of transforming himself and his society. He built many churches and schools and became noted for his acts of charity. Saint Volodymyr's son, Yaroslav, carried on the work of his father and built the Cathedral of Saint Sophia in Kiev. He supplied the cathedral with a library of manuscripts and encouraged literacy among the people. The primary chronicle states, through the medium of books, we are shown and taught the way of repentance for we gain wisdom and continence from the written word. Books are like rivers that water the whole earth. They are the springs of wisdom. The arts and education flourished through the church. Kiev became a cultural and religious center. Over several hundred years, the Christian churches of the East and West had grown increasingly alienated. Rivalries and tensions, misunderstanding and misinformation abounded. In 1054, the Patriarch of Rome and the Patriarch of Constantinople excommunicated each other, causing a major division in the church. There were attempts to mend the rift, but during the Fourth Crusade in 1204, Western Christians sacked Constantinople and vandalized the St. Sophia Cathedral. With this, the separation was sealed and the division remains to this day. Byzantine Christianity provided the foundation of the faith adopted by Rus. Records also indicate that contact was maintained with Western Christianity. 
the early leaders worked to unite the people and shape the character of Christian Rus. Later, infighting among the various princes led to civil war. That, combined with repeated invasions by various tribes of steppe nomads, sent the land into chaos and ruin. The city of Kiev finally fell to the Tatars in 1240. After the destruction of Kiev, many people fled to other Rus principalities, primarily Halicina and Volyn in the west. The metropolitan of Kiev settled in Vladimir on the Klyazma River. His successor moved on to settle in Moscow, but kept the title of metropolitan of Kiev and all Rus. After the initial destruction, the period of Tatar rule allowed the Christian church to exist in relative peace. The church became a unifying and stabilizing force, and Christianity became the treasured faith of the common people. The Tatars were gradually pushed out and the Ukrainian lands were absorbed first by Lithuania and then by Poland. After much struggle, the Kievan Metropolia was again established by the Patriarch of Constantinople in 1470. In Ukrainian lands, there had been a general decline in education and intellectual activity under Tatar rule. In order to maintain the ancestral church and culture within Ukraine and revive historical memory, confraternal organizations known as Bratstva or Brotherhoods were formed. They were dedicated to church renewal within the Orthodox Church by providing public education for young and old. Brotherhoods were also committed to caring for the sick and the poor.
With the development of the printing press, a new age began. In 1581, in Ostrich, Western Ukraine, the first complete printed Slavonic Bible was produced. For centuries, the Eastern and Western churches had been pulled in various directions by internal and external forces. The split of 1054 still existed, and long-standing disagreements and controversies remained unresolved. In the West, the close alliance between church and state had allowed for wide-scale patronage and corruption. The Protestant Reformation was in full swing. In the East, Constantinople was under Turkish Muslim rule and could provide only limited leadership to the Eastern Church. Both Eastern and Western churches were concerned about the spread of the Turkish Ottoman Empire. Among Ukrainian Orthodox Christians, there were two schools of thought regarding how to rebuild Christian life and leadership among the people. One called for increased lay involvement and a revival of Orthodox tradition. The other felt a need to establish a closer alliance with the Church of Rome. Each side was certain it was right. When a decision was made in Brescia in 1596 by the majority of bishops to unite with the Church of Rome, the result was a painful division that is still felt today. Those of the Orthodox Church that remained under the jurisdiction of Constantinople restored Kiev as the focus of church and cultural life. The Monastery of the Caves and the Kievan College became the center for Ukrainian Orthodox activity. The northern political state of Muscovy was growing in power. It began to refer to Moscow as the Third Rome, the successor to Rome and Constantinople. In 1547, the Grand Duke Ivan, later known as Ivan the Terrible, began to call himself Tsar, Caesar. The Orthodox Church in Muscovy had declared itself autocephalous or self-ruling in 1448. In 1589, the Church in Moscow attained the status of Patriarchate. It sought to be the model and center around which the entire Orthodox world would revolve. In the isolated southern steppes of Ukraine, bands of nomadic hunters and refugees from unjust feudal landlords had evolved into a powerful military and cultural force known as the Cossacks. They became the defenders of Orthodox Christianity and the protectors of the Ukrainian population and culture in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Poland-Lithuania refused to allow consecration of the bishops who had not entered the 1596 union with Rome. The result of this was, in 1620, the Patriarch of Jerusalem came and quietly consecrated a new Orthodox hierarchy in Ukraine. It survived under the protection of the Cossacks. Печать дара Духа Святого. Печать дара Духа Святого. 
печать дара Духа Святого. Печать дара Духа Святого. Печать дара Духа Святого. A leading figure in the Orthodox renewal of the 17th century was Metropolitan Petro Mohila. Educated at several European universities and a dynamic leader, he was instrumental in reviving religious, educational and cultural life. He set up a strong education system and developed the renowned Cave College, later known as Mohila Academy. The academy became the heart of Ukrainian education and was a leading institution of higher learning in Eastern Europe. In 1648, Hetman Bogdan Chmielnicki led a rebellion against Poland and for a short time became the head of an independent Ukrainian state supported by all Ukrainian Christians. Under the Cossack state, education flourished. Books printed in Ukraine became a valuable trade commodity. It was during this period that the state designation Ukraina came into wide use. Many churches were restored and constructed. Ukrainian lands were very tempting to neighboring states. The problem for the Cossacks was how to defend a country that had almost no natural boundaries. They were aware that the fragile political survival of Ukraine depended on an alliance. With the area south under Muslim control and the west under Roman Catholic Poland, the logical but uneasy choice was an alliance with Orthodox Muscovy. The ultimate effect of the treaty signed in 1654 was to permit Muscovy to gradually take control over Ukraine. The power of the Cossack hegemonate eventually crumbled through internal conflict and outside political pressure. treaties, Poland and Muscovy divided Ukraine between them. In the early 18th century, Muscovy became known as Imperial Russia. In 1685, the Orthodox Metropolitanate of Kiev was transferred from the jurisdiction of Constantinople to Moscow. This occurred in spite of strong opposition to the move and questionable procedures. This transfer of the Metropolitan brought another separation of the church hierarchy from the people. The Ukrainian Catholic Church 
had retained its Eastern Christian tradition, including the Byzantine liturgy and the right to married clergy. However, there was a continuous struggle to keep from being assimilated by the Roman rite of the Catholic Church. In spite of political chaos and the agony of church politics, the faith, arts, and culture of Ukraine continued to flourish in and through the Christian faith. In 1687, Hetman Ivan Mazepa rose to become a great protector and patron of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Through his efforts, many beautiful churches were built and education flourished. Mazepa also tried to re-establish an independent Ukrainian state with the help of Sweden, but his attempt was unsuccessful. In the mid-1600s, Tsar Alexei had invited teachers from the Mohila Academy in Ukraine to come to Muscovy and help establish a school system there. There was fear by some in Moscow that these Ukrainian scholars and their books were tainted with Western influence, and initially there was strong opposition. Gradually, many Ukrainian artists, scholars, teachers, and clergy were recruited into the service of Imperial Russia. This slow exodus of the brightest and the best enriched Russia and drained Ukrainian society. Through various means, the rights, privileges, and freedoms of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church were reduced. Ukraine was given the title of Little Russia. In the reign of Catherine II, many monasteries and schools in Ukraine were closed. This stopped the publishing of Ukrainian books, and the Ukrainian language was abolished from the remaining schools. The predominantly Catholic western part of Ukraine fared better under the Austro-Hungarian Habsburgs. However, attempts at Ukrainianization were discouraged. The continuing struggle between the Eastern Rite Catholic and the Orthodox churches was effectively used by political powers to keep Ukraine divided. However, it was through the Christian faith that ethnic identity and cultural renewal of the Ukrainian people repeatedly blossomed. Upheavals in Imperial Russia during World War I brought new hopes and dreams for Ukraine. a republic. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church was declared autocephalous 
or self-ruling a year later. Both struggles for independence were short-lived. In 1921, in Kiev, a church council elected a hierarchy headed by Metropolitan Vasil Lipkivsky, and for a brief period, the church grew and flourished under his leadership. In 1918, Lenin had announced the formal separation of church and state. In creating a secular state, all ecclesiastical property was nationalized. The church struggled for its very existence. When Stalin rose to power, there was a further drastic shift in religious policy and action was taken to abolish all religious institutions. Through pressure from Moscow, Metropolitan Lipkivsky was eventually deposed and disappeared into a forced labor camp, a martyr for his people and his faith. The people of Ukraine refused to cooperate with Stalin's plan for collectivization and centralization of power in Moscow. They continued to work for an independent identity and soon Stalin's political plans were set in motion to subdue the people. In 1930, the autocephalous Ukrainian Orthodox Church was unjustly placed on trial for supposed political crimes. Clergy were arrested and exiled or executed. Churches were closed or demolished. By 1936, the autocephalous Ukrainian church had disappeared. A similar fate was in store for writers, intellectuals, and farmers who resisted collectivization and centralization and who sought a unique identity for Ukraine. In 1932, the borders of Ukraine were sealed and internal passports were issued so people could not leave their villages. Grain was shipped out of Ukraine and sold on the Western market while millions of Ukrainians died of starvation. Although all the people of the Soviet Union suffered under Stalin's harsh rule, the fate of Ukrainians was particularly bitter. The Russian Orthodox Church also suffered persecutions. However, by encouraging the faithful to support the war effort against Nazi Germany, it eventually was granted a license to officially exist under close government observation. The Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox Church was reborn in the flames of World War II, but the re-establishment of Russian Soviet rule forced many of the church leaders to flee to the West. Those that remained behind were killed or exiled.
Ukrainian evangelical communities, which had developed in the 19th century, were tolerated only if they consented to register with the government. During the period between the two world wars, the Ukrainian Catholic Church was greatly renewed through the efforts of Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky. In 1946, the Ukrainian Catholic Church was forced to dissolve under pressure from the Soviet state. Many bishops, priests, and lay people were either killed or exiled. The parishes were incorporated into the Russian Orthodox Church. The traditions of the Kievan Church were carried on by Ukrainians living outside the borders of Ukraine. Starting in the late 1800s, many Ukrainians, tired of being locked into a life of poverty, decided to leave their native land for a chance of a new life elsewhere. They went to Canada, the United States, Europe, South America, and Australia. There were many difficulties in establishing formal church structures under pioneer conditions, but gradually religious life took root and prospered. Thirty-five years after the death of Kniaz Volodymyr, Metropolitan Ilarion of Kiev gave a eulogy, which could apply to the descendants of Kiev and Rus today. Behold your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. Behold how they live and how they are cared for by God. How they partake of the mysteries of the Holy Church. How they glorify Christ. How they worship before his holy name. Behold your city radiant with grandeur. Behold your blossoming churches. Behold Christianity flourishing. Behold your city gleaming, adorned with holy icons and fragrant with time, praising God and filling the air with sacred songs. And beholding all this, rejoice and be of good cheer and praise the Lord, the creator of all which you have seen. Through a thousand years, in the midst of the terrors of history, the journey of faith has continued. The Ukrainian people celebrate the holiness of creation and the divine love of Christ. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world.